Okay. Good morning, Rabbi Kripke. Good morning. You must have been, first I wanted to say you must have been very proud to see Saul's lecture. Yes. I couldn't understand it, but I'll get it on tape and I'll study it and see what he said. But um, he has told me plainly that whatever I know, he learned in kindergarten. And uh, at, at Dundee School? Was he in <laughs> kindergarten at Dundee? <laughs> yeah. But uh, he knows so much more than I do, and he's so much, so, so much brighter than I am that uh, there's no comparison. Well, I think you're humble about that. No, not very. <laughs> Rabbi, uh, he was a baby when you moved from New York, is that right? Was he born in New York? Yeah, he was born in uh, Long Island. And yeah. then and then you moved to Omaha? Yeah. Had you ever been to Omaha before? No. What did you think about coming to Omaha? Well, it didn't bother me, but uh, my friends in New York thought I was moving across somewhere beyond the Pacific. They didn't know, they never heard of Omaha, but one guy did. Yes, he said, Omaha, Omaha, yeah. It's near Boys Town. Because he was a contributor to Boys Town. And so he knew it was, Omaha was near Boys Town. That's all Omaha's fame was that it was near Boys Town. So you, you moved out here, and as I understand it, your wife was writing children's books? How did that begin? Well, she used to say little poems for our kids, and uh, I said, write them down. And she began writing them down, and it uh, came that she finished with 12 little books, um, small books really, and meant for Jewish children, but they were widely used by other people as well, because there was almost no mention of Judaism accepting uh, there was one let's talk about Jewish customs and ceremonies and let's talk about being Jewish but other than that they were just general religious books for children the flagship of them was Let's Talk About God, which uh, was reprinted again and again and again, and is still being reprinted as late as all this, because it's being used, well, all over the country. The story that I heard was that Susie Buffett got to know your wife because of the books. Is that true? That is true. And how did that happen? Well, she called one day and said, I've been reading your book. May I talk to you about it? Where, and Dorothy asked her, where are you? And she said, well, I'm right down the street. Well, she said, why don't you come up? And the uh, back door is always open. You'll have to come up the driveway and come in the back door and go through the kitchen and climb the stairs and you'll find me in bed. Because 
she was modestly ill over a long period of time. And uh, Susie and she became fast friends. Do you know what year that was? Or about what year it would have been? Yeah. Would have been about 1933, I think. So you didn't know Warren Buffett at this point, right? Or did you know him through the Rotary? No, I didn't. Although we lived fairly close together, but uh, I belonged to a Rotary Club and he was secretary of it, and uh, the secretary had the duty of finding, finding people for coming late or anything he could think of to find them for. I remember he find some guy for being 90 years old. And he find him, I think, 10 bucks for it. And he said, and when you're 100, you'll have to pay $100 for it. And don't forget, we're going we're gonna to get it. And eventually he did. <laughs> I forgot who the guy was, though who became 100 years old in that Rotary Club. So was Warren a bit of a character in that role? Oh, yes. Yes, he was. He is, as you may know, very clever and witty. And uh, we wouldn't let him be away from that job as secretary. And he was, he was satisfied because somebody said, I don't know if it was he or someone else, said that no matter how busy a man is in his business, he should be able, if his business is good, to leave somebody else in charge for an hour or so once a week so he can come to the Rotary Club and have, they love this word, and have fellowship with uh, other people. So he was, a, he was a very good secretary of our Rotary Club. Where did the Rotary Club meet? I know today there's a Rotary Club that meets at Field Club, but it hasn't always met there. Let's see, where did we meet? I remember it was Friday noon. Okay. But, um, I can't remember where where we met. Okay. It's it's not important. I just wondered about that. The story that I heard was that it was your wife talking to Susie that led you to invest with Warren. Is that yeah. true? <clears throat> Susie called my wife one day <coughs> and said, I've been reading your books and they're wonderful. I'd love to talk to you. So my wife, Dorothy, Aleha Shalom, which means a blessed memory, um, said, where are you now? And Susie said, I'm right down the street. I said, well, why don't you come up? Everybody does. The back door, you'll have to walk up the driveway 
and come in the back door and through the kitchen and up the stairs and you'll find me in bed. So Susie did that and they became really good friends, if I may say so. And uh, my wife wrote uh, 12 of those small religious books for children. She wrote them, of course, specifically for Jewish children, but they were used widely in uh, Christian Sunday schools all over the country. And they're, incidentally, they're still printing them, at least the, the one that might be called the flagship. Let's talk about God. It's still being printed as late as today. And I'm still getting royalties from it, <laughs> which I don't take. I send them to my children. The question that we've asked a number of the original investors was, why did you trust Warren? Because there wasn't a lot of information early on other than what the fund was doing and letters that sent out. Why did people trust Warren early on? Well, he seems to be a trustworthy person and he told the people um, that if they'll give him as an investment $10,000, he'll see to it that they get about thirty, or maybe even $40,000 back eventually for their investment. And a number of people did. Uh, lend him $10,000 for his ideas that he would invest and those people I don't know who they are but uh, they eventually got three or four hundred million dollars for their ten thousand dollar investment the one who knows who they are is the secretary of the Rotary Club. And who is that? Well, his name is uh, I can't get it off my tongue. Mm -hmm. Forrest, Forrest Crutter. Okay. I think that's right. Okay. Did you ever have any doubts about, that was a lot of money in those days, did you ever have any doubts about doing it? Well, I didn't. Uh, I was in California for whatever reason, I simply cannot remember. And I heard about uh, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. So I invested a few dollars and two weeks later I sold it and I made $15,000. I thought I was the smartest man in the world. And then I realized that I was the dumbest man in the world because if it went up like that in two weeks on a few dollars and I made 15000 if I let it ride and let it go. So then I got smart enough to take all the money I had, which wasn't very much, 
but you could buy Berkshire Hathaway on the open market for $63 a share. Now, what year was that? I, you could check that on the history of Berkshire. Mm -hmm. It would have been after 1968 or so, I think, when the original partnership was dissolved. Mm -hmm. I don't know. All I know is I took all the money I had for $63 a share and I bought Berkshire Hathaway and I just held on to it. And the $63 a share became, not overnight to be sure, but in reasonable time, it became a hundred and thirty thousand dollars a share. I remember overhearing, not by not by listening what I shouldn't have been listening to, but because it was an open conversation that I heard a man talking to his son. And he said, you're going to put in a hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's not too bad for a hundred shares. He said, no, 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 it's for one, for one share. He says, nothing is worth that much for one share. But the guy said, it, it, it will be good, it will be good. And of course it was. And those shares became very precious. I have no idea what they're selling for today, maybe 150,000 or something like that. In, yeah, in that range. As a rabbi, you're a teacher. Your son's been a teacher. One of our ideas in this program is that Warren Buffett has sort of been a teacher here in Omaha on matters of investment and now nationally and internationally as someone even the president looks to now for economic advice. Is that a fair uh, assessment in your, in your view? Yes, he, he, he was a teacher because he knew the world of finance perhaps better than anyone else in the world. He was very modest about it. <coughs> if you met him, he seemed like a very ordinary person, somebody like the friends you knew. He put on no airs. I remember at one time, my daughter, who now lives in Connecticut, was in town, and uh, asked if she could get in touch with him. I said, well, you can try. Uh, his number is in the phone book. Call and see if you get any result. Not only did he get, did she get result? But he said, well, come on over. And she said, well, I have my father with me and his aide. And he said, bring him along. I won't uh, feed you, I won't give you lunch, but I will give you a glass of wine. So we all went over there. My aide is, was, uh, I don't know if you know, O'Shea. He's a big, tall, black man. I've met him at uh, Phi Beta Kappa last year, sure. He's a, he's a great guy. And we all went over to Warren Buffett's house. I didn't know where it was, but one of the people did, and uh, Uche, this 
tall, tall, tall black man uh, asked him if he could have a picture. So he said, sure, come over here, stand here, and take a picture. And he said, without that picture, my f friends and family in Nigeria would never believe me that I was with Warren Buffett. But with a picture, he became a very important guy in all of Nigeria. That is so true. We have a visiting professor from Shanghai, China right now. And we go, this is the fourth year we've taken students to see him and he talks to the students for about two hours and then we go to lunch. Oh. And so I took our visiting professor from Shanghai and uh, he had a picture because Warren will let everybody have a picture with him yeah. and sent it back to the newspaper in Shanghai and they put it all across the front page. <laughs> <laughs> they would. He's internationally known as the great student of finance. Did you know that he taught this finance course at Omaha U? I know you taught there. What, what was it like in those days? Well, I taught uh, <laughs> nothing of importance to finance. I taught uh, what is religion what is Judaism and the history of the Jews. So I taught one or two of those three subjects every semester for 24 years at Creighton. And uh, Creighton was kind enough to say that I was a good teacher and they actually gave me an honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. I had had some DHLs before from Gratz College in a suburb of Philadelphia, DHL, Doctor of Hebrew Letters or Doctor of Hebrew Literature. So they were all DHLs. The other question that we've asked people uh, around town is, you know, it seems like at this point uh, we we uh, spoke to Mr. Holland about the Holland Center for Performing Arts and Mr. Mammal about the Mammal Building. That although Warren has other interests, his friends, the people who uh, have benefited from these investments, ha have really made a difference in Omaha. Oh yes. So what's what's your opinion on that? Well, he never. Uh put on airs about it. He's not a proud man. He, if you met him, he's like any one of your other friends. He, uh, the good guy. I remember, remember when he was secretary of the Rotary Club. And uh, he said, no matter how busy, maybe it wasn't he who said it, but somebody said, no matter how important a guy is, no matter how busy he is, he ought to be able to take off an hour or two a week to go to have fellowship with other Rotarians. And. Uh, he came regularly, and as secretary, he, I think I told you, he, he fined people for various offenses, like coming late or eating too much, <laughs> something like that. 
Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you remember about Warren that you think uh, would be important to know or about what Omaha was like during this period of time? I remember uh, I think it was my son was in London and they asked him where he was from and he said from Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska? Did you know Warren Buffett? And he said, yeah, sure. I was in his home just a couple of weeks ago because my daughter had called him up and he said, come on over. So we came over and my son Saul had a, an interesting talk with him because Saul knew what he was talking about and he knew that Saul was a bright person and a philosopher, a philosopher indeed of note. So the, the two of them talked a great deal and the rest of us just enjoyed our wine and listening to them. It does seem that, that Warren uh, reaches out to very smart people who know things and, and wants to talk with them because we've heard that about the one of the first meetings between Warren and Charlie Munger at, at Mr. Holland's house at a, at a party and they went off and had a conversation. Yeah. And we've heard it about Bill Gates uh, and, and, the, and the relationship they've forged with Bridge and, and other matters. He was always uh, eager to listen to people who had something to say. He didn't want to do ordinary chit chat but if there was somebody who had some intellectual standing, he was glad to talk with them. There are a number of people around Omaha who are worth, I think I said this, three or four hundred million dollars because they invested ten thousand dollars with him when he was just getting started. Did, did, um, did you play bridge? You and Dorothy play bridge with Warren and Susie? Yeah, but uh, <coughs> my wife, wife Dorothy had no card sense whatever. So playing bridge with Warren, who is of national and international importance as a bridge player, as well as a f expert in finance, uh, it didn't last very long. But uh, somebody else took Dorothy's place and they did play bridge in our home for a while. Bridge, of course, is a uh, an excellent game. It's, it's an intellectual game like chess. And it is as difficult a game as chess if played properly. Most of the women who play it, everybody who has aces plays the aces and then they play their kings and their queens and that's how they play it. But that's how bridge is not properly played. It's a, an important intellectual game. See, I, I had 
always heard that the first time you met Warren was by playing bridge with that Susie and Dorothy played bridge and then you played too. They, they played at our house, as a matter of fact, on Happy Hello Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So did you meet him playing bridge or did you meet him at the Rotary Club? I met him at the Rotary Club before that. Mm -hmm. He still tells the students that come to see him that they should learn how to play bridge, that it's good for them. <laughs> That's so? <clears throat> well, bridge is a, a very good game when it's played properly. It's like chess is an intellectual game. Oh, go ahead. Did uh, Warren and Susie ever go to Bethel when you were rabbi to to uh, see your your home? He came to my 90th birthday party at Bethel. How about when you just got there in the 40s, in the 1946 and 1950, <clears throat> when you just met? No, he came to my 90th birthday party. And uh, people were impressed that Warren came. It made me very important. <coughs> One other thought that I had growing up in Chicago um, from time to time, I would uh, experience prejudices. What was Omaha like? I mean, in the in the fifties and sixties, were there discriminations? It was interesting to me how many Jewish people settled around Dundee School in that area here. I don't think there was any prejudice at that point. Um, so it was a pretty good community to to be living in then. It 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 is it was and it is. Omaha was a very friendly city, was then and remains so now. Did you ever meet Rose Blumkin, Mrs. B? Very briefly, just that. And uh, I remember once I was at the Nebraska Furniture Store and uh, I wanted to buy something. And she butt in and she said, give the rabbi 10% discount. <laughs> she used to drive around on a golf cart in the store, telling everybody what to do and so on. And she had a computer mind, she knew everything in the store, what it was and when it was bought and how much it cost. She could identify any item and how many of them they had and how important they were and what the cost was and what the selling price was. She had an unusual mind. We met her when we first moved to town 22 years ago, and she was on that cart, and uh, it was before they opened that other store, oh. but we saw her over there too. But yeah, she, she remembered everything that, uh, I think she was probably close to 100 by then. Yeah, she was. But she had an amazing mind for what the store had and when it was bought and how much it cost and so on. Looking back on this whole period of time, the 1940s, 1950s, now from where you sit with the perspective and context, is there anything that surprises you about how it all came to be? Yeah, 
if there's anything surprising about it, it's that it was not surprising. It just was normal, just happened by, by itself. That it was uh, very simple, ordinary, day-by-day -day stuff. One of the investors told us it was the beauty of compound interest. If you just put it away and forgot about it, it would do fine. Yeah, yeah. He once said that the uh, early settlers at Plymouth Rock who paid stuff worth about what was it, $14 uh, for enough uh, corn to see them through the winter. And he said, well, they really overpaid because if the $14 were invested at 6% compounding yearly, uh, it would now be worth, whatever year that was, it would now be worth, he said, everything in Manhattan Island, including the island itself, and every building in it, every bank in it. So they really overpaid when they paid about 14 bucks for enough food to carry them through the winter. His secret then is not that different from Mrs. B's philosophy of paying uh, the right low price and being honest, right? Yeah, but he was able in his mind to take the 14 dollars and 6% and the next year 6% more and each year 6 until he said they really overpaid because what it became now was, I don't know, a couple, several billion, the b -b -b billion, not million, and uh, it could buy everything in Manhattan, including the island and every building in it and every bank in it and so on. He had a very lucid mind and uh, it went very fast. I wanted to go back to one thing you said earlier about originally selling stock and then realizing that that wasn't the right thing to do. The right thing to do was to leave it in because it seems like that's the other secret in this is that a lot of people try to ride the psychology and waves of the market as opposed to just investing. Yeah. But as far as Berkshire Hathaway is concerned, if you were fortunate enough to buy it low, you just held on to it. And uh, if you held on to it enough, you soon became a wealthy person because it kept going up. When, uh, when, when you were, did you, no. how did it come about that the library at the Jewish Community Center uh, is named the Dorothy N. Meyer S. Kripke Library? Did you talk to Warren about that? No. No, you just used your money? We just gave some money for it. The library then was struggling. It didn't have a place and didn't have an income, so we gave them enough money to uh, buy a place for the Jewish Community Center Library, and we also found them a guy who would regularly buy books 
um, what was his name? The shame. Is it Gary Katz? Hmm? Is there Gary Katz? Who's there? No. Now? Like Edie Wolf? The guy who was able to buy books and continue to buy books for the library so that it is now considered to be the best Judaica library, at least between Chicago and Los Angeles, and it is very good. My son, who occasionally has been here and has gone to the library, has found things that he couldn't find at the Princeton University Library, where he had been studying and then teaching. Well, this has been delightful, Rabbi. I'm so pleased that, that we've been able to take some time today to, to talk with you and record, record your comments. And we certainly will get a copy for the library. We also recorded Saul's program at UNO, so we're going to have a copy out here for you for that I'd as like well. I'd like to have that. I know you'd like to see that. Because uh, I, I couldn't hear most of it. And Saul sort of swallows his words when he uh, lectures, although he gets offended if I say that to him. But I heard you say, sitting behind you, I heard you say you were impressed that he went way beyond the time and the room was still packed. Yeah, yeah. Almost nobody left. Very good, I think. Do you need anything else in terms of other shots? Or? Just a little room presence. Just okay. Uh, just 10, 15 seconds with nobody talking. And then I think we should maybe, if we can, get a little video of the library would be nice. If we can just, if there's a possibility to get a little bit of that, that would be good too. Great. Well, thank you again for talking with us. It's okay. It's been an honor to talk with you and oh, a pleasure, really.